Hi everyone out there, John Bruno, Fiber Instrument Sales and Fiber Instrument Sales University, or like we say FISU, right? Uh, I want to welcome everyone here to your free two-hour video series uh, that's courtesy of Fiber Instrument Sales. Uh, I've really enjoyed teaching over the years. I've been doing this for 24 years and I've taught over 24,000 technicians in the field uh, from every walk of life and every different uh, fiber optic field that we could think of. Uh, and I've really enjoyed it all. But I thought, you know, maybe we would put a series together here. And to create that series, uh, this course that I've done, uh, I've selected some videos. We have over 125 videos in our library uh, that we filmed. And I've selected the most appropriate ones uh, that would fit into these 14 chapters uh, of the fiber optic topics that we have. So, Again, the most appropriate ones, which you're gonna see some fiber optic, uh, from FIS fiber placement uh, and some promotions during the videos. But again, really let's concentrate on the information that you can get from this. It's, it's an excellent learning experience and I think you all enjoy it. Uh, to start off with, I'm gonna present the very first video. Uh, it's gonna be some fiber theory and some basics. We wanna ground you in the basics. So every every chapter is a learning on the previous chapter uh, and build your, build your education up throughout the whole course. Uh, Brian will be uh, your moderator. He's going to be walking you through and connecting you to the, uh, the many interesting videos that we have set up. Uh, so sit back, uh, appreciate the world of fiber, and I'll be revisiting you throughout. So uh, I'll see you all real soon. See you. Hello, my name is Brian, and I will be providing key information in understanding each video presented. You have already been introduced to John Bruno, who will first present a short review of fiber optic theory. How light travels through glass and its resulting advantages is why the fiber optic technology exists. Short excerpts from a Corning produced video provide insight to how the fiber itself is produced. Chapter 1 Fiber Optic Theory and we talk about a, uh, an English philosopher by the name of uh, John Tyndall or John Tyndall. He performed an experiment around 1870 that led us to fiber as we know it. So his experiment did not involve the typical fiber that we know of as glass. He had an experiment where filled a basin full of water and we know that the smallest particle of light is a photon. And what he did is he shined light onto the surface of this bucket, let's say, of water. We know what happens when light reflects off of the surface of the water, right? We get the photons bouncing away as a reflection. But we also get where the photons will actually enter the water and they will bend a little bit, what we call refraction. And at this point in 1870, they all knew about refraction and reflections. This is nothing exciting. Tyndall didn't discover this, but what Tyndall discovered was when he pulled a stopper from the side of the bucket, that allowed the water to obviously flow down to a lower basin. The genius of his experiment is he noticed that those photons of light that refracted into the water, they would actually continue and migrate themselves down into this lower basin. This was this whole experiment. And in 1870, not quite sure what he was going to do with it, but if we look forward to fiber optics, you know, this is really the concept of, of fiber here. The water is doing what we call total internal reflections. The light will stay trapped between the barriers of the water. And we've got this from uh, Tyndall. The difference we know is that we don't make fiber out of water. You know, it'd be easy to make the cables, hard to splice and connectorize. So what we do is we've replaced this medium, this medium of water, and we replace it with glass. Why would you choose to run fiber instead of a copper cable? Uh, there's several different advantages to running a fiber optic cable. Let's take these one at a time. Really, the number one reason, and I'll be honest, if bandwidth was the only advantage fiber had, we would still use it. Number two, low attenuation. So you look at low attenuation, low loss, right? We're talking about low attenuation ultimately gives us longer distance transmissions, right? We can transmit longer distances. Number three is a big one. Number three uh, can be, if you look at EMI and RFI, electromagnetic interference, radio frequency interference. Interference is an issue when we talk about copper cables. 
fiber is not susceptible to these outside interferences. Number four, a little more obvious, I guess, would be uh, size and weight of the cable. Why is size and weight an advantage? Well, if you look at the size of a copper cable and a fiber optic cable, and you look at your conduits and the things that you run your fiber in, there's a fill rate. And the last one, number five, is safety and security. Okay, so now I want to talk about uh, something we call index of refraction. Index of refraction refers to, basically we talked about light and how it's a sine wave. It refers to the speed of light through a medium. Most of us consider the speed of light, if you're looking, if you're watching like a scientific program, they refer to the speed of light and light years. The speed of light is not a constant number. Now, the number that we are familiar with is about 186,000 miles a second which is about the equivalent of 300,000 kilometers a second. We always consider that the speed of light. Truth be known, that is the speed of light in a vacuum. That's the fastest anything can travel, truthfully. Einstein told us that is uh, the theoretical maximum speed we can achieve. We've yet to prove that wrong. Index of refraction is basically equal to the speed of light in a vacuum divided into your medium. That's how we get the index of refraction value. Uh, it's a ratio, basically. So if you look at it, I just mentioned speed of light in a vacuum is 300,000 kilometers a second. And if we divide that into 300,000 kilometers per second, obviously that's a one. Anything divided into itself is one. So our base index of refraction value is always going to be a one. And that always signifies that we're talking about the speed of light in a vacuum unencumbered, I guess. And again, this is the principle on how fast a photon travels through a medium. So if we look at our indexes of refraction, again, a vacuum, the vacuum of, where would that be? Space. Light is traveling, photons are traveling about 300,000 kilometers a second. But as we change mediums, as we change materials, index of refractions change. As an example, our atmosphere, our, the air on our planet, has an index of refraction of 1.00033. This number, and many physicists would, uh, would reprimand me for saying this, but this number is so close to the index of refraction of a vacuum that we're going to say that it's the same speed. This substance, very common on Earth, this is water. This is the, and again, this is the average for water. If you do the math, that's approximately 225,000 kilometers per second, right? As we said before, as this number increases, our speed decreases. Think of when that light is traveling into the water, you're doing what? You're changing it from approximately 300,000 kilometers a second down to 225. That speed change, that mismatch, right? is the excess light that the water can't take. Think about it. It, it just can't take all of this 300,000 speed light. So again, the overflow is that reflection that we get. As this number increases, this number decreases. So we have another number here. You can see this is a, an even bigger slowdown. One and a half index of refraction is about 200,000 kilometers a second. As we know, as this number increases, we're changing mediums. This would be your typical index of refraction for glass. And I know there's lots of different types of glasses, so they're not all going to be one and a half. That's, you know, the average, let's say. All right, single mode fiber versus multi mode fiber. So we have two kinds of fiber, and we need to answer the questions why do we have the two types of fiber? So we'll start with, you know, kind of the pinnacle of fiber, it's the top shelf of fiber, which is going to be your single mode fiber. If we take just the fiber itself, we remember that it's made up of glass and we have a core and a cladding. This is a, an example, an enlarged example of single mode fiber. And when you look at single mode fiber, you'll notice a very small core. When we look at the fiber itself, basically uh, the core has a dimension of uh, 9 microns, a diameter of 9 microns and the cladding has 125 micron dimension. When you put this in human perspective, a 9 micron core is about the equivalent, let's say about 1 11th of human hair. As we've talked before, we use lasers as our source of light for fiber. 
When we talk about single mode, again, I said there's specific wavelengths that we use. The two very popular wavelengths would be 1310, and we talked about this, the measurements, what, nanometers? 1310 was used, then we moved to a 1550 laser. When you look at multi-mode, uh, popular belief is that multi-mode is a larger fiber. Technically, it's not any larger because the cladding size is the same size of that of single-mode fiber. Overall, they're both 125 microns of the same size. The core sizes are different. Yes, multi-mode core sizes are larger. So when we look at the cladding, it's still that 125 micron size, but our core is either going to be 62 and a half microns or 50 microns. Uh, Multi-mode uses typically two different wavelengths, 850 nanometer and 1300 nanometer. 850 is a more popular nanometer wavelength used for our light sources. 850 and 1300 are the two wavelengths that we use. 850 being a little more popular because the electronics are uh, less expensive than the 1300 wavelength. Uh, when we talk about the, the attenuation values of uh, single mode fiber, you know, 0.3 dB at 1310 and 0.2 at 1550. With multi-mode fiber, you know, at that 850 wavelength, we're losing about three decibels of signal strength every kilometer we travel. So 3 dB is kind of a very important number. When you look at single mode, the 0 0.2, 0 0.3, you know, we're only losing three to five percent of our signal per kilometer. With multi-mode, again, that three decibels represents 50 percent light loss. So every kilometer of distance, you're losing half of your power. Every time you talk on the phone or go on the internet, what you say or type travels to its destination through fiber optics. Voice and data gets transmitted via pulses of light through hair-thin glass fibers. Those fibers start out as large glass tubes. First, workers unwrap the tubes. Then they submerge them in a corrosive bath of hydrofluoric acid that removes any oil residues. Then they set a tube into each end of a lathe. As the tubes spin, they're heated with a hydrogen-oxygen flame. When the glass turns white, it's getting close to hitting peak temperature. At about 3,500 degrees, the two tubes fuse together. They put this new longer tube onto another lathe. As the tube spins, they inject a mixture of chemical gases inside, while a traversing burner heats everything up. The gas mixture contains liquid forms of silicon, an abundant chemical element found in nature, and germanium a chemical element similar to tin that's used as a semiconductor in transistors and other electronic devices. As the gases heat, they undergo a chemical reaction that leaves a white soot on the inside of the glass tube. The heat fuses the soot, forming what will eventually become the core of the optical fiber. The glass tube itself will form the fiber's covering. When there's enough fused soot, they turn up the heat until the soot itself turns into glass. Then they heat the glass tube enough to soften it and to soften the new glass inside. The intense heat eventually makes the tube collapse on itself to form a solid rod. The internal structure of the optical fiber has been achieved. But it's in the form of a big bulky rod called a preform. So the next step is to thin it out. First, they excise the preform from the uncollapsed section of the glass tube. Then they install it vertically into the drawing tower, which will draw out the final shape. The drawing tower's oven heats one end of the preform to 3,600 degrees. Oh, 
The glass softens. Gravity helps pull it down, like honey dripping from a spoon. Then, using a glob of glass as a weight, they stretch the soft glass and keep stretching it until they formed a thin glass fiber. A series of pulleys measure the tension on the fiber as it's being drawn. A special monitor makes sure the fiber is precisely the right diameter, just five one thousandths of an inch. Then the fiber passes through UV lamps that bake on an acrylic coating to protect against dust and other contaminants. Finally, the fiber is rolled onto a drum. From here, it's either shipped out as is or put into a cable. Fiber optic cables are expensive to produce, but they're smaller and lighter than traditional copper cables. They carry more information and need fewer repeaters to keep the signal from deteriorating. And unlike copper cables, they're immune to electromagnetic interference. They're also hard to tap without being detected. And all of this is made possible by a complicated process based on a very simple principle – light traveling through glass. Chapter 2 – Fiber Optic Connectors Let's first look back at the fiber optic link. The fiber cable with connectors makes the connection between the transmitter and receiver. A fiber optic connector is a housing that aligns two fiber cores using ferrules. Our first one minute video reviews the most popular single fiber connectors and common polish types. The most common are LC, SC, ST, FC, and MPT style connectors. All of these types of connectors can be used with either single mode or multi mode fiber. There are three types of polishes which can be applied to a fiber connector PC, physical contact, UPC, ultra physical contact, APC, angled physical contact. Each polish type exhibits a different level of back reflection. Back reflection is a measure of the light reflected off the end of a fiber connector. This light is measured in decibels. Our second 3-minute video presents one popular style of quick termination field installable connectors. These connectors are offered by multiple companies. These popular factory pre-polished connectors are installed by cleaving the field fiber. Cleaving is the process of cutting the fiber end flat. Once cleaved, the field fiber is inserted into the back of the quick termination connector. The cleaved fiber butts up to the pre-cleaved fiber inside of the connector and is then permanently attached. Note we have introduced in our picture a 12 or 24 position fiber MTP or MPO connector that will be discussed later in Chapter 4. In this video, you will see the termination process for the FIS bobtail connector on 900 micron fiber. Here are the items necessary for installation. Universal bobtail holder with visual fault locator. Fiber optic cleaver. Fiber stripper and scissors. Quick cure epoxy and accelerant. Cleaning solution and wipes. An FIS bobtail connector. Begin by sliding the 900 micron boot onto the field fiber. Next, strip an inch to an inch and a half of the 900 micron jacket from the end of the field fiber. Be sure to remove all of the acrylate coating from the fiber. Wipe the fiber clean with cleaning solution before cleaving. Cleave the field fiber to 10 millimeter. Place the field fiber onto the universal bobtail holder's sliding clamp. 
Be sure the buffer extends past the end of the v-groove and is flush to the end, as shown. Position the metal stopper into the hole for the connector type you are terminating. This video shows an ST connector. Remove the dust caps from the bobtail connector and place the connector into the universal bobtail adapter. For splice optimization, connect the visual fault locator with a patch cord turn the unit on. You will see the inside of the bobtail connector glow red. Slowly slide the field fiber up and into the back of the connector's fiber channel until you hit the metal stopper. You will begin to see the light diminish. To optimize the splice, remove the clamps and gently push the fiber until the light diminishes significantly. Take the bobtail epoxy applicator and squeeze a drop of epoxy filling the fiber channel and covering the 900 micron fiber. Spray with accelerant as needed. Slide the 900 micron boot up to the back of the connector. And you have now completed the FIS bobtail connector. Chapter 3 Splice on Connectors We continue on our journey of the investigation of connectors, touching on the pros and cons of four field connectorization techniques. Epoxy and polish, quick term connectors like the bobtail, fusion splicing a pigtail, which is a connector on a short cable, and lastly the splice on connector, or SOC. Because the SOC is dominating the field install market, we choose to go into detail. Our field install comparison is done by John Bruno in a 5-minute video discussion. Hello again, John Bruno from Fiber Instrument Sales. want to talk about the choices that we have when we do connectorization in the field. Now understand this, we really, with all the companies out there and all the types of connectors, there's really only three possible methods to install a connector. Now, all connectors are manufactured the same way when we talk about them in the manufacturing facility. But we're talking about in the field. How can we install our connectors? And again, only real three real possibilities. And one is really kind of leading the way and becoming the de facto standard. So let's talk about our histories and our different options. So the first one that we're going to talk about is your traditional polishing and doing the hand connectorization. So hand tools are required. We have to have uh, polishing pucks and jigs or we're going to use polish machines so advantages and disadvantages advantages are going to be uh, the polish connection directly connected no extra attenuation we can achieve using the machines so very low optical return loss connections with APC and UPC end face geometries but really for all practicality the price of the equipment and the labor that it takes this is really nothing that we really want to do anymore in the field so what's the next option? The next option we have would be using a mechanical splice connection or what they like to call as quick term connectors. Quick term connector has already been polished by the manufacturer, low reflection qualities on the ferrule, but what happens is inside the connection there's a fiber stub and that stub is cleaved perfectly 90 degrees. So we take our field fiber that's being installed, we're going to cleave that to 90 degrees insert to the back of the connector, we have a butt splice, and then some camming type of motion or cl clamping motion to hold that fiber in place. So again, advantages and disadvantages. Advantage, quick termination, very fast. Disadvantages, we tend to have more disadvantages than advantages here. Some of the disadvantages would be where those connectors come together, we have an index matching gel. Now we do get some extra attenuation there, and we do add to our back reflections. Uh, and again, we know back reflections are not a great thing. The other thing is, yes, we've reduced labor costs, but these connectors tend to be fairly expensive, and we also have to have a kit that can cost up to two or three thousand dollars to install these connectors. These really dominated uh, the the installation world uh, for quite a long time until the popularity arose of our third installation procedure in the field, and that would be fusion splicing. 
And so traditionally what we've done is again, we'll take that, that factory manufactured connection and basically what you're getting is basically half of a, of a patch cord. It's a connection with the low reflective properties that we're requiring for the bandwidth needs of today. And basically we're not even doing the connector, we're just cleaving that fiber and we're fusing splicing that pigtail right to that field fiber. So advantages here, inexpensive, you know, our, um, our pigtails tend to be fairly inexpensive. The, the great thing about the pigtail is there's no additional reflections added in that fusion splice as compared to the mechanical where we do get those reflections. So again, we're getting a higher quality and really when it comes down to the prices, uh, it's the cheapest and highest quality way to do it. One of the disadvantages I can understand is when we splice that pigtail, we have a splice sleeve three feet, four feet down the line, and we have to manage that splice sleeve. We have to put them in trays, and we have to have extra room in our racks, you know, and that real estate is valuable. valuable. We don't really want to uh, occupy more space than needed. So from that really came our best option, and that's what we call a splice-on connector, an SOC. There's many out there. Fiber Instrument Sales makes a great one, a Cheetah connector, or for three mil an armadillo. And really, essentially, all that is is a pigtail that's been shortened down. So instead of feet, it's millimeters. So we have a field and field manufactured low reflection connector, but that splice is right at the back of that connection. And now when we fuse and splice that, again, no reflections from that splice, very low attenuation. When we shrink the sleeve, it's at the base of the connector. We pull the boot up. It covers the sleeve, no need for fusion splice trays, no need for larger boxes, no need for that uh, cable management. So really what we're seeing is uh, an explosion of these sales and people are realizing there's no higher quality way to install a fiber and no quicker or less expensive way. So that's kind of the nutshell. If you have any questions, feel free to give me a holler here at FIS. First, let's look at the steps required to install an SOC, or splice-on connector, on a 900 micron diameter tight buffered cable, commonly used in network closets or data centers. This 3.5 minute video uses a Fitel Fusion Splicer, but you can find the FIS, AFL and Sumitomo equivalent videos on our website. In this video, you will see the termination process for the FIS Cheetah Connector on 900 micron fiber. Here are the items necessary for installation. Fusion splicing machine. High precision cleaver. Optional heat shrink oven. Fiber stripper and scissors. Cleaning solution. And the FIS Cheetah Connector. Begin by sliding the 900 micron boot and splice protection sleeve onto the field fiber. Next, strip an inch to an inch and a half of the 900 micron jacket from the end of the field fiber. Be sure to remove all of the acrylate coating from the fiber. Wipe the fiber clean with cleaning solution before cleaving. Place the field fiber in the splicer's removable 900 micron holder. Be sure to place the buffer to the end of the holder to ensure the proper cleave length of 10 millimeter. Cleave the fiber. And place on the left side of the machine. Take the FIS Cheetah SOC. Remove the cleave protector and ferrule cap. Place the connector into the FIS Cheetah SOC holder. Place the connector holder on the right side of the splicing machine. The setup should look as shown before performing the splice. Close splicer lid and splice fibers together. Remove clamp on fiber holder and bring splice sleeve up. Lift the field fiber and allow the splice sleeve to slide to the connector, pushing the sleeve to position as needed. 
Before shrinking, the sleeve should sit as shown. Set the connector holder onto the heat shrink oven and set connector and splice sleeve as shown. Start the heat cycle on the oven and the start button will begin to blink. When the light begins to blink faster, the cooling cycle has started. If additional heating time is needed, you can press the start button again to initiate a reheat cycle of 15 seconds. Once the sleeve is shrunk, remove the connector and allow the splice to cool. Slide the 900 micron boot flush up to the back of the connector. For SC style connectors, snap on the outer housing, making sure the keyway is on top when installing. You have now completed the FIS Cheetah Splice On Connector. Our next 6 minute video shows the installation of the Splice On Connector on a 3 mm diameter fiber cable using an AFL splicer. The crimping of the sleeve to the cable and Kevlar provides extra desired pull strength. The techniques of stripping and cleaving are critical skills technicians should learn. In this video, you will see the termination process using Fiber Instrument Sales' Armadillo 3mm Splice-On Connector using the Fujikura 62S Core Alignment Fusion Splicer. Here are the items needed. Fujikura CT30 Cleaver, FIS Universal SOC Oven, SOC Holder, 3mm Cordage Holder, Crimp Tool, Kevlar Shears and Tri-Hole Stripper, Cleaning Solution and Wipes, Screwdriver. Before any splicing, an important practice is to calibrate the fusion splicer. This is called an arc calibration. On the 62S, press the menu key, scroll over to window number 5, and select arc calibration. Prepare and load left and right fibers into splicer. This must be done using single mode cable. fibers are loaded, close the lid and begin the arc calibration. Once power and position is good, the machine is successfully calibrated. Now let's set up the machine to splice the Armadillo 3mm splice-on connector. First, let's select our fiber type. Press the menu key, select splice mode. Select single mode auto. Once selected, press edit mode button. Scroll down to Proof Test. Press the Select button to turn off. Turn on the Universal SOC Oven. Make sure the time is set to a 3mm splice-on connector, 30 seconds. Next, remove both fiber clamps from the splicer. Remove the alignment tool from the CT30 cleaver. Place the boot crimp onto the end of the boot and slide the boot onto the cable. The larger opening of the boot and crimp should face towards the end of the fiber where the splice will be made. Next, slide the brass crimp sleeve onto the cable. Using the provided strip chart, Mark and remove 35 millimeters of the 3 millimeter outer jacket. Use the shrink sleeve to hold the Kevlar back as you place it on the cable. Next, mark the 900 type buffer to 5 millimeters. Strip, remove all of the acrylate coating, and clean. Next, place it into the cordage holder as shown. Place into the cleaver. Make sure the 900 micron buffer is against the pad and not resting on it. 
cleave the fiber. Once the fiber is cleaved, load the holder into the splicer. The cleaved fiber should rest inside the V-groove. Remove the dust cap and protection sleeve from the SOC and load it into the SOC holder. Be careful not to nick the end of the fiber. Place into the right side of the fusion splicer. Close the lid and begin the fusion splice process. After achieving a successful splice, open the clamp of the cordage holder and carefully remove the back end of the cable from the cordage holder and pull up and away from the SOC connector. This will prevent the fiber from breaking. Do not hold on to the connector. Slide the splice sleeve down while holding on to the Kevlar. Place the connector into the holder of the oven and adjust the sleeve up against the connector post. Close the lid and press the start button. Once the speed of the blinking light increases, the cooling process has begun. Once the light stops blinking, the heating process is complete. Allow the sleeve to cool down for two to three minutes. Once cool, pull up the crimp sleeve and capture the Kevlar over the connector post as shown. Follow the crimp diagram on the back of the strip chart according to the style connector. Crimp both connector and cable end of the brass crimp sleeve. Remove any excess Kevlar. Slide the boot all the way toward the end of the connector until the crimp sleeve is no longer exposed. Crimp the back end of the boot. Apply the outer housing. you have successfully spliced the FIS 3mm Armadillo Splice-On Connector. Chapter 4. MTP or MPO Style Connectors As promised, we will be introducing the MPO, Multi-Fiber Push-On Connector. The MPO is often referred to as an MTP connector. The MPO commonly provides, in a single connector, 12 or 24 fibers. Its many parts make it one of the more complex connectors to assemble, polish, and test. The MPO connector utilizes three polarity methods, type A, B, and C. All 12 fibers connecting straight through to another MPO or MTP connector is the type A polarity, reversed is type B polarity, and flipped type C polarity. Single-mode MPO cables must utilize the type A polarity only while Type B is preferred for multi-mode cables. Our two-minute video was created to promote FIS product, but provides insight to the complexities of a factory-completed connector. This will be followed by a video that shows the process of inspecting an MPO connector with an Exfo Video Inspection Probe. This will complete our connector presentation. High-density fiber optic applications requiring MPO MTP style connectors of 12 and 24 fibers presents many new connector assembly and hookup considerations. The expectation is to enable a single composite ferrule to successfully create a light connection of multiple fibers is a high expectation. To consistently assemble an MPO connector, the following developments were required. Specialized heat curing ovens providing horizontal positions instead of vertical, and temperature control and curing time are carefully monitored. Complex holding fixtures for the polisher introducing adjustable pressure points for each connector, enabling the desirable required polish of UPC or APC. Inspecting the geometric polished connectors calls for visual and interferomic test capabilities. Establishing proper fiber orientation of a male and female connector position was required to be incorporated. Style A, B, and C fiber locations within the ferrule's positions had to be defined. A special tool to convert male to female's ends now exist. 
a MPO power meter and light source, or a test set, to establish all fibers were performing to acceptable standards. Each test set contains 12 lasers and 12 detectors, confirming styles A, B, or C, and that no cross-connects occur only by the push of a button. Test set is complete with reporting capabilities. Visual Red Light 850 nanometer laser systems are now in development. All test equipment and heat ovens are manufactured by Fiber Instrument Sales, available for immediate delivery. All right, how's everyone doing out there? I hope we're all staying healthy and happy. Uh, John Bruno here, I'm gonna give you a little bit of uh, some tech tips here. And we're gonna start with one of them, uh, which is one of my favorite products, is the Exfo uh, Microscope. And I get a lot of questions on how do I, uh, how do, I do end face analysis of uh, MPO or MTP connections. And one of the things I wanna point out is uh, Exfo makes an, an excellent uh, microscope probe. One of the things you're going to notice, if you had bought one in the past, uh, and it's a little bit older, you're going to see a metallic body here, and basically nothing here indicating that it'll do MPOs. This is not set up, this uh, FIP is not set to do the MPOs. You will see, and I'll get this out of the way because we're not going to want to use that, you're going to see on the newer models, and it's been a little while, so... Um, the one thing you want to do is just check to see if you have this but uh, you'll see on the collar here it says mf ready uh, that's for your multi-fiber tip so this is the uh, probe that you're going to want to have it's got a little notch to hold the the adapter and uh this guy here here's your adapter it would come in this case this is actually two pieces this piece just screws in for sake of time i'll save you that but this is their mpo uh, probe tip so when you do the MPOs you're going to have to get the microscope and you're going to have to get this piece here and what we do is we take off our normal tip and there's a little uh, a notch here and there's a, uh, a male and a female version and we're going to push down on that notch and we're going to slide this collar up and screw it into place and we'll get this adapter here and now we're ready to go I've got a sample cable here that we can test. Uh, you're also going to see uh, for the female version here, uh, this is an adapter that goes on the end for our female cables. And we're ready to test. Um, when we come over here to the Exfo unit, all right, so we fired up our Exfo OTDR here. And I've got my probe and it's wireless. You're going to notice a, a USB cable here. My battery, I looked, it was a little bit low and I didn't want it to go out in the middle of this uh, presentation. So we're just using that for the power. But when we first fire up the max tester here, it'll identify itself and link to this unit. Uh, you're gonna notice here that it has a little bit of a trigger here and we have three positions. You can see a little window for the positions. This, is, this probe will actually capture four fibers at a time. So the four positions are fiber one through four five through eight and nine through twelve so we're just going to notch across to do the different positions so if you've ever taken any of my classes or see my videos you know i'm a clean freak about stuff but we're going to just look at this guy sight unseen no cleanliness let's see what we got here and when we when we do this we push a little tab in here and we plug in and that will secure that to the unit and you're going to start seeing here the unit is doing its auto focusing and we're going to see right here in the screen there's our first four boy these fibers are terrible aren't they you can see a little bit of the alignment hole here this is a female so you can see the the hole there but you can see my first four fibers and in our setups and i won't go too deep but if we go into our uh, user preferences there's a couple things we can set up here if you do have this on a different unit you can do individuals but we're, we've set this up to do the fours um, other preferences are uh, don't continue if there's a failure so if you see a bad connector it won't have you go to the next four because it knows it already failed uh, i've got certain things set up and you can play with that again it's in the user uh, preferences but there's my first four and what we would do is hopefully you wouldn't even video capture this because it's so terrible but we would capture these four and you can see it's saving and evaluating each end which are terrible 
And then what we would do we was pull my trigger back to the next four. And we would capture the middle four here. And then we would go to my third position. Let's finish this before we move it. Boy, it doesn't like these fibers at all. And then we're going to slide over to the fourth. The, I'm sorry, the last four uh, fibers. And you can see again, there's your female port here for the alignment pin on the other side. And we would capture these. And then we can go into our report software and see the IEC standard end face evaluation for these. So that was just a quick little uh, rundown on how to use this unit. Uh, another little point that I would like to show you here is, well, John, what about the males? Well, we can take this adapter off and put another adapter on. And this is set to do the male connections. Here's my male MPO connector. And what we can do is plug in the male and go through that same process. So hopefully this helps you out a little bit, makes you understand how to do the iron face analysis. And remember, clean, clean, clean. I know I didn't clean it in the beginning here. I just wanted to show you a, a nasty, uh, not real pretty end face. This cable would definitely not pass. Thank you very much. Chapter five, fiber optic cable. We are now introducing our fiber optic cable section. The parts of a simplex cable are the outer jacket, aramid yarn, also known as Kevlar, 900 micron coating, 250 micron acrylate buffer, and fiber cladding and core. Duplex cable or zip cord is side-by-side -side simplex fiber construction. Some of the more popular multi-fiber cables are distribution cable, containing multiple counts of color-coded, 900 micron jacketed fibers or micro distribution cable containing multiple counts of 250 micron, color-coded bare fibers. Loose tube, used outside only, is fibers placed in tubes filled with a petroleum-based, water-displacing gel called IckyPick. This gel protects the fibers from moisture, but the cable is limited to only 50 feet inside of a building due to the toxicity of the smoke produced when the gel burns. There are many other cable styles, and to get to more particulars, let's look at our first video of two minutes that explores simplex cable components and the fiber types utilized. The core is a continuous strand of super thin glass, step index graded glass, that is roughly the same size as a human hair. It is the center of the fiber cable and the medium through which light pulses are transmitted. The core is surrounded by a layer of cladding. The cladding size is 125 microns and surrounds and reflects light back into the core. The core and cladding together is referred to as the optical fiber. Fiber optic cable has the three common core sizes. 9 micron is single mode. 50 and 62.5 micron is multi-mode. Tight buffer is a 900 micron thick plastic material coating layer protecting the cladding. Aramid yarn, better known as Kevlar, is the strong synthetic material or yellow hair used as a protective outer sheath for the tight buffer that protects the glass fiber core. Its high tensile strength protects the cable from damage when being pulled. Surrounding the aramid yarn is the cable's jacket, which is the outside cover of the cable body. Depending on the type of cable, the industry standard color codes help identify these cables. Yellow is the standard for OS1 and OS2 single mode. Orange is the standard for multi-mode OM1 and OM2. OM3 is aqua and OM4 is aqua in North America, but in Europe it is magenta. The newest cable standard is OM5, the jacket color is lime green. All outdoor fiber cables are black jacketed to protect from the sun's harmful ultraviolet rays. Manufacturing cable, which is done at the light connection cable plant, requires complex payoffs, extrusion processes, and spool take-up systems. Our one and three quarter minute video ad created by the light connection provides insight to a cable manufacturing facility. During this video, you will see many of the cable components previously mentioned being manufactured. Fiber optic cable sends data at the speed of light 
because they operate by transmitting light through optically pure fibers of glass. Fibers that are a width of a human hair can transmit over long distances providing higher bandwidth. FIS offers fiber optic cable produced by the Light Connection, a subsidiary of fiber instrument sales. For 30 years, TLC is a leading manufacturer of American-made standard and custom cable and tubing for the fiber optic industry. Every product is cable rated by UL. Riser, Plenum, and Low Smoke Zero Halogen are some of the jacket choices available, and they are all Rojas compliant. Being partners with Corning Optical Fiber, all of the cable manufactured is with Corning's latest fiber offerings. Along with Corning's Bare Fiber, FIS sells, Simplex, Duplex, Distribution, Micro Distribution, Dry Loose Tube, Indoor Outdoor, Ribbon, and Breakout Cables, including Aluminum Interlocking Armor Cable. We also offer furcation tubing in all 12 industry standard colors for easy cable termination. With Fiber Instrument Sales' large warehouse, including other locations in the United States, for the customer, this means superior stock to choose from, greater custom capabilities, and shorter lead times. Lower shipping costs will deliver your cable to you cost-effectively and quickly, so you are ready for your current or next project. A fan-out kit, or breakout kit, has been selected to close our section on cable. When a cable end is to be connectorized, all 250 micron coated fibers must be inserted into furcation tubes before a connector can be installed. Our two minute video walks you through installing the fan out kit provided by FIS. After the cable is broken out to the correct length following the instructions of the fan out kit, cut and remove the buffer tube of the OSP cable. It is important to remove all of the icky pick from the fibers in the subunits. Take the FIS icky clean and completely remove the icky pick from the fibers. After the icky pick is removed, use isopropyl alcohol and wipes to thoroughly clean all of the fibers. You should hear a distinct squeaking while cleaning. Lay the fibers out and pat down with a rosin bag. This will help with fricating the fibers into the tubing of the fan out. Using duct tape, secure the frication block to the side of the table. Insert the fibers 4 to 5 inches as to not tangle or cross, and insert in the correct color code starting with blue. After the fibers are partially inserted, remove the frication block from the table and pull the block toward the cable slowly to fricate the fibers all at once. Once fully fricated, simply snap together the plastic clamp to complete the install of the fan out kit. Chapter 6 Fusion Splicing Fusion splicing is the act of arc welding two separate fibers into one continuous path. Installed outside plant cables, splice on connectors, or pigtails all must be fusion spliced. The splice has negligible reflection, low loss, and is strong. These splices with protection sleeves are commonly placed into a tray that is inserted into a protected housing or closure. A one-minute video talking about the lower cost of splicers will first be shown before we delve into splicing particulars. In the 1980s, the cost to purchase a fiber optic fusion splicer was approximately five times greater than today's prices. The basic difference is today's splicers provide better performance and are easier to use. How has this impacted the application of fusion splicers in actual applications? It is now affordable for the contractor to inventory multiple units, minimizing downtime. Reduces cost of rentals when the occasional use doesn't justify a purchase. Enables higher connector performance and lower connector installation prices of field installable splice-on pigtails or splice-on connectors. 
Increased bandwidth performance by ensuring low reflective fusion splices are used as repair procedure throughout the network. Fiber optic manufacturers increase production efficiency with multiple splicers at floor locations. It is now on to fusion splicing particulars, which will be shown in the most popular FIS video to date. This 7-minute video has been viewed over 314,000 times on YouTube. We will detail making a single fiber and a ribbon fiber fusion splice. We start with the important arc calibration using an AFL-70S splicer. See our FIS website providing videos using the CA3, AC5, Fitel S179, AFL70, and Sumitomo Type Q102 fusion splicers. The most current model of AFL core alignment splicer is the 90S. It replaces the 70S. In this video, you will see single fiber fusion splicing and ribbon fusion splicing on the AFL 70S and 70R splicing machines. Here are the items to perform a single fusion splice. AFL 70S splicing machine, CT30 cleaver, fiber stripper, cleaning solution and wipes, and FIS splice sleeves. When first turning your fusion splicer on to begin a splicing session, you must remember to perform an arc calibration. The arc calibration will account for altitude, humidity, temperature, and barometric pressure, depending upon your location, and will set the machine to the correct power for arcing. Set the machine to the arc calibration through the menus as shown. You must use single-mode fiber for arc calibration, even if you are splicing multi-mode fiber. Strip. Clean. And cleave your fiber. load into the machine. The first arc calibration failed and must be reset. Repeat the process for fiber preparation. Once you have an acceptable calibration, you can begin splicing. After the arc calibration is accepted, set the fusion splicer to the correct splice mode for the fiber type you are splicing. The AFL 70S and 70R machines has several built-in splice recipes for many fiber types. In this video, the machine is set to the auto single mode multi-mode setting and we will be splicing single mode fiber. Next, set the fusion splicer's heater to the correct heater mode for the type of heat shrink you are using. The AFL 70S and 70R machines have different heater settings for the different size shrink tubes. In this video, we will set the machine to the 60 millimeter sleeve for the size we are using. First, Take the splice sleeve and slide over one of the ends of fiber you are splicing to. Prepare both ends of the fiber by stripping, cleaning, cleaving, and placing into the machine. Once the second fiber is loaded, the machine doors will close and the splicing action will begin. Once the splice is complete, the machine will perform a pull test to ensure splice integrity. Lift the fiber from the machine by keeping slight tension on the splice as you are lifting. 
slide the splice sleeve over the splice and place inside the machine's oven. The heating cycle will take about 30 to 40 seconds, depending on the size sleeve you are using. Remove the splice and allow for it to cool before handling. You have now completed a single fiber fusion splice. Here are the separate items to perform a ribbon fusion splice. 70R fusion splicer, hot jacket stripper and 12 fiber ribbon holders, ribbon splice sleeves. Begin by sliding the ribbon fusion splice sleeve on one end of the ribbon fiber you are splicing together. Take the 12 fiber ribbon holder and place the ribbon fiber in the holder with about an inch and a half extending past as shown. Take the hot jacket stripper and place the ribbon holder as shown and once the light turns green, the unit is hot enough for stripping. Close the unit, pull back on the slide and the ribbon matrix will be stripped off. Remove the excess ribbon matrix from the hot jacket stripper. Clean the fibers with cleaning wipe and solution and set the fiber holder into the cleaver and cleave the fibers. Place the holder into the splicer and repeat the process for the second 12 fiber ribbon. When the second fiber is loaded in the machine, the doors will automatically shut and the splicing action will begin. When the splice is complete, lift the ribbon fiber from the machine by keeping slight tension on the splice as you are lifting. Slide the splice sleeve over the splice and place inside the machine's oven. The heating cycle will take about 30 to 40 seconds depending on the size of the sleeve you are using. Remove the splice and allow for it to cool before handling. You have now completed a ribbon fiber fusion splice. Back to art calibration. Our second most viewed one and a half minute video is used to refresh the technician on this critical splicing step. This function should always be performed in the field before any actual fusion splicing is done. When first turning your fusion splicer on to begin a splicing session, you must remember to perform an arc calibration. The arc calibration will account for altitude, humidity, temperature, and barometric pressure, and will set the machine to the correct power for arcing, depending upon your location. You must use single mode fiber for arc calibration, even if you are splicing multi-mode fiber. Set the machine to the arc calibration through the menus as shown. Strip, clean, and cleave your fiber and load into the machine. Once you have an acceptable calibration, you can begin splicing. There are three different kinds of single fiber splicers. Core alignment, which uses cameras to align the fiber's cores using two-axis movement. This method yields the lowest average losses per fusion splice. Active V-groove alignment. This splicer uses the same axial movement as the core alignment splicer, but aligns the claddings of the fibers. The least expensive option is the V-groove splicer that aligns the fibers as they passively sit in a V-shaped groove. The FIS AC5 is an active cladding V-groove splicer. As the splicer is used, the V-grooves can become filled with contaminants and must be cleaned to avoid fiber misalignment and splicing errors. John Bruno asked for a minute and a half to demonstrate. Hi, 
Hi again, John Bruno, Fiber Instrument Sales and in FIS University. Hey, I want to give you guys a quick little tech tip. Real easy to do, but this could save you plenty of time in the field. You're going to notice that a lot of our splicer manufacturers will include a small little brush, and a lot of you have probably ignored this. Anytime we use a splicer, whether it be core alignment, cladding, or active clad, sometimes we get issues of alignments of the fibers, and I've seen people get very frustrated at this. One of the easiest things we can do when we're getting that core alignment error and the, fi and the fibers aren't aligning right in the splicer, the easiest thing we can do is clean the V-grooves. Obviously, it can be very frustrating when our fibers won't align, align in our splicer. I've seen many a time when a technician or a splicer will pull that fiber out, put it back in again, still won't align, it gets very frustrating. This brush is provided by many of the splicing companies, and we can sell these to you separately if you don't have one. Give us this brush, and these bristles are very stiff, and we can clean out our V-grooves. It's sometimes as easy as cleaning that V-groove, and the next thing you know, that fiber will align perfectly. Chapter 7, Cleaving Fiber. Cleaving the fiber to prepare for either fusion or mechanical splicing is a must requirement. At the end of this chapter, we will introduce mechanical splicing. But let's start with John Bruno for four and a half minutes, goes into the particulars of the Precision AFLCT50 cleaver. I always like to give you guys brand new technical information. You know, fiber's always been evolving over the years, and uh, AFL Alcoa Fujikora has come out with a new CT50 cleaver. Pretty slick little cleaver. Just want to give you a little heads up on what can they do to make a cleaver better. Uh, one of the things you'll see here uh, is it's got Bluetooth, so we can link it to whatever splicer that you have. It'll tell you all the information, how many uh, cleaves it's done. But really, personally for me, I love this feature here where you can actually rotate and uh, height in the blade on this cleaver. Uh, one of the long time coming things, and you know, it's taken years for us to come up with this, but it kind of seems obvious, is uh, one of the big issues that you guys always tell me and I always put in my ass Brunos when I get a chance is, you know, how do I rotate a cleaver blade and how often do I have to do it? Well, the new CT50 here has a blade that actually has a function for auto rotation. So we have different uh, wheels on the bottom here. If you can see this, this will, every time this cleaver does a splice or does a cut, it will actually rotate the blade. And we have a little counter inside of this guy and it goes from 1 to 16. Those are the 16 locations uh, on the blades. One of the things I had questioned about it was, well, you know, AFL, the, the blade doesn't always wear evenly. So maybe position 2 and 3 went bad a lot sooner than the rest. So every time we rotate through that blade, you know, we're going to get two, three bad cleaves in a row. We're not going to want to recut our fiber every time. So they said, you know, John, we've, we've thought about that. So you can actually stop the auto rotation. I think that's a fantastic feature. What we can do is stop the rotation, wear out one position on the blade, rotate it automatically once, and then use that position. So we won't get that uneven wear. We'll just run through the, the blade positions. Another nice feature, too, is we can change the height on the cleaver blade here. So it'll start out on the low position, but we also have medium and high. Real nice about that is when you rotate all the way through the 16 positions, you can raise the blade two more times. So we're looking at at least 60,000 cuts on this blade before you ever have to do anything else. And always remember, if you don't feel comfortable changing the blade or rotating it when, it when the opportunity exists, you can always have our technical department do it, our calibration services. Just another little service that we provide. Um, the other nice thing about this guy, obviously removable trash container and it's a little longer than the last. Um, nice too is you get a lot of complaints about you know, your typical cleaver when we're doing ribbon splicing, we splice so many fibers that every spl every time we cleave, it's like 12 cuts on the blade. So with this auto rotation feature now, you're going to get around 5,000 cuts before we have to replace that blade. So just wanted to show you what's new in the fiber world. And again, remember, check out FIS University. We've also come out with an online program that you can take. Uh, sign up. I believe it's $195. 
Um, we're looking at getting Bixie certification that's in process. And uh, I hope to see you guys again or for the first time in one of my FIS university classes. Thank you. The FIS Lynx Cleaver is a high-end precision cleaver offering fewer features, but at a lower cost. This short one-minute video allows you to compare two of the many precision cleavers available. The FIS Lynx family of fiber optic cleavers offers high precision at a low cost, and they're suitable for any job. They are compact, ergonomic, durable and precise. They're perfect for all cleaving applications from splice-on connectors to an emergency fiber restoration. All Lynx cleavers have a cleave angle of 90 degrees with 0.5 degree variance and they cleave 250 micron and 900 micron fibers. The Lynx precision cleaver uses a three-step process that will fulfill any cleaving requirement. The 16 position blade provides 48,000 cleaves before it needs to be replaced. When it is time to service your Lynx cleaver, please contact our calibration department and set up service to keep your cleaver performing properly. To purchase the FIS Lynx family of cleavers, contact Fiber Instrument Sales on the phone or go to our website at fiberinstrumentsales.com. When a fusion splicer is unavailable and a fast connection of fibers is critical, the mechanical splice will serve you well. A mechanical splice is often used as a temporary connection until a more permanent fusion splice replaces it. Note that the FIS low-cost cleaver easily makes an acceptable cleave in this three-minute video. In this video, you will see a demonstration of the FIS Ultra Splice. The FIS Ultra Splice is a great tool for bare fiber testing spool length verification, and emergency repairs. We will be showing a bare fiber reel mechanical splice with the optional VFL. Here are the items necessary for installation. Cleaning solution and wipes, fiber optic field cleaver, fiber stripper and scissors, optional VFL, FIS Ultra Splice. The FIS Ultra Splice is designed to accept both 250 micron and 900 micron fibers and uses a threaded cam to keep the fibers in place. For use with 900 micron fiber, remove the blue insert on the side the pigtail will be inserted. Strip an inch to an inch and a half of 900 micron jacket and 250 micron coating from the end of the pigtail. Be sure to remove all of the acrylate coating from the fiber. Wipe the fiber clean with cleaning solution and wipe before cleaving. Using the field cleaver, cleave the fiber to 7 mm as shown. Insert the fiber into the ultra splice as shown. You will be able to see the fiber through the splice window and stop inserting when it is halfway through. Use the VFL as shown to aid in the insertion and mating of the splice. Next, take the bare fiber from the spool and strip an inch to an inch and a half of the 250 micron coating from the end. Be sure to remove all of the acrylate coating. Cleave the fiber to 7 mm. Keeping the blue plug in the ultra splice, insert the bare fiber as shown. The connection will be optimized when the red light diminishes. Thread the other end of the cam on the splice to lock the fiber in place. You can now test a bare fiber spool for loss and length verification. The ultra splice can also be used for emergency repairs. Simply insert both ends into the splice for any combination of 900 micron and 250 micron fibers. Thread the fibers in place for a quick emergency repair.
Chapter 8 OTDR Operation OTDR stands for Optical Time Domain Reflectometer. This is an important piece of optical test equipment that will measure the length of a fiber and indicate light loss locations. By plotting the power reflections on the y-axis and distance on the x-axis, an OTDR trace or scan reveals the key information of light losses, reflectance, and distance. OTDRs have evolved to satisfy specialized user needs and now include extra capabilities to enhance network testing. Our first three-minute video of the Thunderbolt nicely illustrates the basic OTDR function and the extras. In this video, you will get a quick rundown of our Thunderbolt OTDR. As you may know, an OTDR is a very valuable piece of test equipment out in the fiber optic testing field. It can give you the distance of your cable as well as physically determine where and how severe any faults are along that line. For example, it can tell you where there is a bad fusion splice or where you have a highly reflective event caused either by an old mechanical splice or a mated connector pair. The Thunderbolt has seven critical fiber optic tests and they are an OTDR, a power meter, a visual fault locator, an end of fiber checker, a gigabit analyzer, reporting software, and an optional connector inspection probe. So let's go over all these applications. To navigate around the main menu screen, use the rotary dial wheel in the top right hand corner of the unit, or simply press the arrow keys to highlight the application you wish to enter. To enter the application, press enter at any time or depress the rotary key. Here's the OTDR functioning with a loss, distance, ORL readings, as well as an event table displaying all the events, whether they are reflective or non-reflective. The power meter, which is included on the unit, works as any power meter would. You just hook it up, take a reference and start testing. The end of fiber checker allows you to conduct a quick five second test that gives you the distance of the cable, the amount of attenuation occurring, as well as the dB per kilometer loss that is occurring on the cable as well. The gigabit analyzer allows you to find out if your cable is physically able to handle one gig or 10 gig network traffic. The VFL or visual fault locator is a simple red laser that has about four to five kilometers of range to do a quick continuity test on shorter runs or to find macro bends or breaks in your cable. The project mode is there to set up a project if you're going to be testing multiple cables of the same length in the same location and it organizes all the data easily and effectively. As you can see, our Thunderbolt OTDR can handle a range of different testing applications in the fiber optic testing field. Once again, this OTDR can measure your distance and identify physical faults in your cable. If you would like pricing or a quote, please contact FIS by phone or visit our website at fiberinstrumentsales.com. Our next two-minute video will quickly restate the Thunderbolt's features, but will go into more detail explaining OTDR operation, the power meter, and real-time features. The ability to plug an OTDR into an installed network and determine its capability of handling a 1 gigabit or 10 gigabit Ethernet signal is an impressive capability. Select the fiber type and the OTDR's measurement of distance, losses, and reflection values are automatically compared for you against the fiber's operational requirements. Our one and a half minute video of the Gigabit Analyzer function explains further. The great thing about the Thunderbolt OTDR is that it encompasses an onboard power meter, a visual fault locator, an end of fiber line checker, as well as a gigabit analyzer. When you power on the unit, this will be the main menu screen that appears. To navigate through the different applications, simply turn the rotary wheel or press the arrow keys to make your selection. Right now I'm going to talk to you about the gigabit analyzer. The gigabit analyzer should not be confused with an ethernet tester. Rather, it checks physically if the fiber can withstand 1 or 10 gig signals. 
What the Thunderbolt has done is it has programmed in various cable manufacturer specification and compares them to distance, attenuation, and back reflection. So before running your test, simply choose the type of fiber you're going to be testing and then select one or 10 gig ethernet signals As you can see, the Gigabit Analyzer uses those three measurements and gives you a pass-fail for each one. As you can see, the Thunderbolt OTDR encompasses everything a technician would need to certify a fiber optic network. If you need any more information or want a quote for pricing, please contact Fiber Instrument Sales on the phone or check our website at fiberinstrumentsales.com. John Bruno's technical tip talks about testing a fiber link with an OTDR in both directions or bidirectional averaging. Discussed is the use of pulse boxes and how only the bidirectional average loss of a splice or any event is the most accurate measurement. Welcome back, Fiber Instrument Sales, Ask Bruno, John Bruno here, another Ask Bruno tech tip. What do we got for you today? Well, today we're going to talk about an issue when we talk about OTDR testing. Just recently got this Ask Bruno question from a customer out in Tennessee doing certification testing. The customer rejected all of his tests, asked, us, asked them to do it again. He said, reason we're rejecting is because we didn't use a launch cable or a pulse suppressor on either end of my task fiber. Asked John, really, why would I have to do this when I already had a launch cable at the beginning? The contract says he wants a bidirectional test, so I'm going to take that launch cable and go to the other side and test back. Obviously, I'm going to get it on the second side. So what we're saying is that end connector, it, you can't test because there's no fiber between that and the end. But his theory was, well, we're going to have, when we go back down to test in the other direction, right, A to B and then B to A, well, we'll be covering that connector in that second test. So why did they reject the test? I've seen people reject tests because no, they didn't use any launch cables, and that makes a lot of sense. But really, this customer knew what they were asking for. The true attenuation of any OTDR event, so any bend, any splice, any connectors, is not the value in the single direction. The reason, the primary reason they ask for bidirectional testing is so that we can do the bidirectional average of that event. Most of us don't do this. Most of us don't realize this. If we look at the 10 commandments of OTDR testing, this is gonna be number one. Thou shall bidirectionally test all of our events. The OTDRs, some of the uh, more advanced softwares, uh, will actually give you an option so when we test, we, we can tell it how many fibers we're testing, location A and B, and when we run through that test, when we go to the other side, we switch B to A and it will reverse the naming process, and then we can merge those files together with the software, and it will give you your bidirectional average so we can do pass-fail. So why aren't people putting boxes on the other end? You know, several reasons. Number one, they feel like they're testing it anyways because of their bidirectional. They don't realize the reason that bidirectional is written there is for the average. Problem with only testing each end one way is we can't average for the attenuation. Um, the other reason, I mean, let's be honest, we don't want to pay somebody sitting on the other end and just basically moving a box all day. He has no test equipment in his hands, right? So I can understand why we'd want to leave it out, but if we're going to be sticklers, if we have a customer that's a stickler, the true way to certify any OTDR event is with the bidirectional average. Hence, we need two boxes and we have to have a guy on the other end moving that box all day. If we follow OTDR testing to the letter of the law, that's why the his customer rejected the test and asked for the two launch cable test. Hopefully this helps. I hope maybe you might we might have changed some of the ways you might do the OTDR testing and Maybe we can get away from having this issue happen to you. Um, you know, we want to teach you every proper procedure there is, and this is definitely one of the big ones. So thanks again for tuning into my videos. I appreciate it all, and uh, I hope to see you guys on the road at a training. Thank you. Chapter 9, Power Meter and Light Source. In review, 
Recall the OTDR provides the user with the particular locations of back reflections and attenuations, along with the length of fiber, which may identify a breakpoint or a macro bend. The power meter and light source, called a test set when both are contained in the housing or presented together, measures only the net loss of light or the attenuation in a length of connectorized fiber. This is perhaps the most popular test performed. We will demonstrate a one reference cord, type A test only. This test measures the light loss of the fiber, all connectors and splices, but not the mating loss of the connector plugged into the power meter. A two reference cord, type B, test procedure does test both end connectors. In the one reference cord testing of a patch cord, which is a shorter fiber with two connectors, the patch cord must be reversed to confirm both connectors' performance. Our three-minute video carefully walks you through each step. In this video, you will learn one patch cord reference testing using the FIS power meter and light source. Here are the items necessary for testing. FIS power meter and light source. Patch cords and an adapter. Mandrel for multi-mode and an FIS one-click bulkhead ferrule cleaner. You have the light source and power meter. For the light source, give it a few minutes for the laser to warm up. The display shows the current wavelength that is on. To change the wavelength, press the lambda symbol to 850 or 1300 nanometers. The top right button modules the tone. And bottom right button is for the backlight. On the power meter, when you turn it on, it will be on DBM to read absolute power. If you want to plug into a live signal, you can plug straight in and it will read your DBM value. To change the wavelength, press the lambda symbol. The bottom right button is the reference button. This is for to measure relative loss on patch cord or cable. First thing you need to do is clean the ports of the light source and power meter. Next, clean the connectors on the reference cord and plug it into the light source and power meter. For multi-mode testing only, you need to use a mandrel wrap. This mandrel is for 50 micron fiber. Also, there's a mandrel for 62.5 micron fiber. Wrap the cable four or five times. Take the clip and clip it into place. Here's the absolute value reading. Now it's time to reference or zero out the value. Press the reference button and the display changes to DBM to DB. It is important to never unplug the reference cord from the light source through the test. Always disconnect from the power meter. Remove the reference cord from the power meter and attach it to the adapter. Clean the connector on the patch cord, insert it into the adapter, then clean the other connector and plug into the power meter. The reading on the power meter will give the loss on the connector. To test the other connector, simply remove the connector from the power meter, insert it to the adapter and take the other connector and attach it into the power meter. The display shows the loss in dB of the other connector. Now you have completed the one reference cord test. Chapter 10, MTP, MPO test set. In chapter four, we became familiar with the MPO or MTP 12 and 24 fiber connectors and the ABC polarity positions. The MPO test set, referring to the power meter and light source together, now has the job to examine the multiple fibers contained in the connectors. You will see a similarity to the single fiber test procedure, but first a capability to identify the polarity of the fibers that will be performed before testing begins. In this five minute video, exporting data for creation of reports is demonstrated as well. The FIS-12 Fiber MPO Test Set 
which is available in multi-mode or single-mode configurations, is a two-piece kit that contains a power meter and light source designed to test and certify MPO-style assemblies quickly and easily. This set will provide the user with link attenuation readings over all 12 fibers in less than 15 seconds, as well as the ability to verify A, B, C, and 40 gig polarities. These units will work in virtually any MPO application. And here's how to operate the FIS-12 MPO test set. For a polarity check, push Options, then use the arrow keys to move up or down the selections. Push the F1 button or select to choose polarity check. Then select the polarity that you want to check for. Make sure the light source is on auto sequence. As you can see, it failed because this is a polarity A patch cord. Now we will select Type A polarity, because this is a Type A polarity cord. Again, make sure the source is on auto sequence. Now, as you can see, it passes for Type A. For Pass-Fail Threshold, set the threshold by using the arrow keys and then set it. To turn off the pass-fail threshold, just change the dB to 0 or select Reset which is the F2 button. To take a power reference, make sure the source is on auto sequence. Connect your reference cord to source and meter, then select F1 button for reference. Read and follow the on-screen instructions. When ready to take reference, press 0 slash test button. Wait a few seconds as source cycles through all 12 channels. When referencing is finished, introduce the test cable, then select polarity of test cable to start lost test. Within seconds, you will have all of the 12 fibers test results displayed and measured against the user-defined pass-fail thresholds. Finally, to save test results, simply press F1. To export saved data from your MPO power meter, use the supplied USB serial cable to connect the meter to your personal computer. Make sure the power meter is powered on before connecting to the PC. Take the supplied USB drive from the test kit and select the application MPO Test Report 2.6. You can also download the software from fiberinstrumentsales.com forward slash downloads. Once the software is opened, use the mouse to click and open the available COM port. This should now connect the power meter with the software, starting from the meter screen on the power meter. Enter the Options menu by pressing F3. Use the arrow keys to scroll down to Export Results. Press F1 to select. You can now choose to export a single file, a range of files, or all files. Again, use the arrow keys and F1 button to make your selection. When ready, press F1 to export. Now you can see that the files were immediately transferred to the reporting software on the left-hand side of the screen. You can individually inspect any of the files by clicking on the file number with the mouse. You'll notice that each file has the polarity and wavelength tested, the dBm power output, dB loss value, the pass-fail threshold, and if each fiber passed or failed. At the top, you can fill out the header information as well. When you want to generate the report, go to the top menu and select Reports. You can generate an individual file that's highlighted or generate all currently exported files. Once this selection is made, you have the option to save the report file wherever you like. The report will be saved as a PDF file. Chapter 11, Enclosures. When a cable ends at its destination point, it will require a housing to protect the fiber connectors, 
fusion splices, or a component called splitters. Splitters passively divide the light signal into multiple pathways. These housings can be classified into two groups, indoor or outdoor. The indoor units most commonly are mounted into racks, often located in closets along with the active equipment. Wall mount units are used when a dedicated location for racks is not available. Outdoor versions that protect splice points are often called closures, and they can be either buried or aerial mounted. Our popular Zeus line provides outdoor NEMA-tested cabinets for both pedestal and pole applications. The most popular requirement for the Zeus product is housing connectors and splitters to accommodate fiber to the home projects. Let's first look at the inside racks. Our next 3-minute video will show both inside rack and wall mount enclosures, focusing on the mating sleeve considerations that enable the many required fiber optic connections. Over the past 30 years, Fiber Instrument Sales has manufactured and distributed high-quality fiber optic products all over the world. Maintaining one of the largest inventories in the industry, FIS has evolved its full line of interconnect rack mount and wall mount enclosures engineered and manufactured in the United States and designed to complete the total passive network offering. FIS's stock rack mount enclosures include 1RU, 2RU, 4RU, and 8RU units with the capacity to accept up to 576 fibers utilizing an LGX-style compatible adapter plate footprint. High-density feed-through adapter plates and MTP-MPO cassettes can be installed in either slide-out tray or swing-out enclosures. Stock wall mount units include economy and deluxe enclosures accommodating two, four, or eight LGX adapter connector panels. Deluxe wall mount enclosures feature split removable doors, top or bottom cable entry, and mounting stud for splice trays. Both FIS rack mount and wall mount enclosures can be delivered pre-installed with multi-mode or single mode cable, assembly buffered pigtails, or stubbed multi-fiber pigtails to eliminate additional labor at the installation site. Customers can utilize the engineering team at Fiber Instrument Sales for custom modifications to stock enclosures or complete their own unique line of rack mounts or wall mounts. Beginning with the conceptual design, the FIS sales and engineering teams keep in constant communication with the customer and use the latest technology to develop drawings, create models, and modify each unit based on the network's needs. Custom options include changes in body design, choice of aluminum or steel materials, metal or Lexan doors, port labeling, silk screening, high-tack labels, or laser etching of company logos, and a spectrum of powder-coated colors. Thanks to the FIS family of companies, customers directly benefit with savings on production time and costs. Fiber Instrument Sales is vertically integrated with access to precision CNC machining, injection molding, metal fabrication, fiber optic cabling, and custom cable assembly. FIS is proud to provide designers, contractors, and facility owners with a full fiber optic solution and the confidence that the passive cabling system will meet network requirements as well as future expansions. Contact Fiber Instrument Sales today to fulfill your entire passive network requirements. Now a video on the Zeus line of outdoor cabinets will complete our enclosure chapter. Zeus offering from Fiber Instrument Sales. Your telecommunication requirements may demand an outdoor cabinet to house a fiber distribution hub system or any type of hard and active optical equipment. Our Zeus offering provides an all-aluminum cabinet tested to NEMA 4 standards. We will provide the racking and the brackets you require. Select from our pad, pole or wall options, our cabinet sizes range from 24 by 27 by 14 inches to and 36 by 27 by 14 inches. Since Fiber Instrument Sales designs, fabricates, powder coats, and assembles all Zeus cabinets, our offering provides a value superior to others. Our full manufacturing capabilities enable us to produce sometimes difficult to acquire racking that will accommodate almost every application. 
Our 35 years of dedication to fiber optic cable assemblies made us into one of the country's largest cable assembly manufacturers, if not the largest. This provides us the capabilities to produce and install your Zeus cabinet with the cable assemblies and any splitters modules cassettes you require. Our fiber distribution hub will support up to 576 terminations, leaving ample room for your passive splitter module cassettes or your 1x8 to 1x64 splitter modules. They will be provided plug-in ready installed in unit. Fiber to the home and passive optical network require specialized drop cables customized to the location's requirements. OptiTap connectors or our standard SCAPC tap connectors are installed on drop cable manufactured on campus at our sister company. Assembled drop cable with tap connectors commonly become part of the order requirement. Yes, made in the USA is more important than ever. This range of product offering allows you to purchase made in USA without having to pay more. Chapter 12. Network Design Transmitting data using fiber optics is most popularly accomplished over a local area network by utilizing a 1 gigabit or 10 gigabit Ethernet protocol. Designing a network utilizing SFPs with media converters makes possible newly created networks or expansion that utilizes your existing switches. This video reveals a quick design approach by answering five questions to provide instantly a technical drawing and a quotation. Secure actual design software from our FIS website, fiberinstrumentsales.com. New from FIS, this is a new custom software tool that provides a fiber optic network extension plan that is smart, simple, and hassle-free. Based on information about your existing network, the software provides you with a technical drawing and detailed quotation. Go to fiberinstrumentsales.com and click on Network Expansion Tool. You will be able to explore this new software free from identification and create your results within seconds. Answer five short questions about your existing server connection, fiber type, cable distances, and the final destination. Submit your answers, including contact information, which is optional, and you will get an immediate quote and technical drawing showing a plug-and-play design to expand your network. If you decide to purchase the proposed package, you will receive your custom plug-and-play kit that includes connector cleaning supplies and installation instructions. This software is designed to reduce the amount of time normally that it takes to produce a formal quotation. Your management or customers will be impressed by your promptness. If you have any questions, feel free to call FIS at 1-800-500-0347. John Bruno, in a 4-minute video, talks about how copper networks will actually negotiate speed, where fiber optic networks do not. This important information will impact your network system design considerations. Welcome everybody, John Bruno here back at Fiber Instrument Sales sitting in my office, uh, the rare occasions that I get to get back. I was just reviewing some of my Ask Bruno questions. I get a lot of questions and I, I really implore you to send in any questions that you have, emails or phone, either way, very reachable. But one of the questions I've been getting a lot is, uh, it's reared its ugly head, let's just say. I used to get it a lot in the past, now I'm seeing it more often, so I thought we would address it and that is the... Uh, the difference between fiber and copper over ethernet and to be more exact uh, difference in speeds so as you guys may or may not know ethernet uh, networking tended to, to first start out with your 10 megabit ethernet then we had your 100 meg and gigabit and 10 gig and 40 and 100 you know as we're moving on one of the things you may notice on uh, products especially copper is if we have a copper port it might be a 100 meg port but you'll see it'll actually say 10 100 and if it's a gigabit it'll say 10 100 1000 and that means that the copper depending on what you plug into that that copper can speed up or slow down 
right? It can negotiate the speed. So if I have a gigabit copper switch and yet I'm plugging in, a, let's say, a converter or a device that's running 100 meg, that port knows well enough to slow down. Well, recently I just had an issue where a customer had an issue where he, was, he wasn't getting any traffic through. Uh, he was seeing a link light, but he couldn't get the, the data to pass correctly. And all had to do with the fact that he was using fiber. Fiber cannot negotiate the speeds. So whatever port that that fiber port is made for, 10 meg, 100 meg, gigabit, 10 gig, it can't slow, up, slow down or speed up its speed. So the real critical factor when we're linking two ports with fiber over ethernet is that those port speeds on each transmit and receive side have to match the speeds or we won't get any transmission. The long and the short of it, a real quick explanation, especially in your multi-mode side, if we look at the history of light sources and what controlled what speeds, our, our first 10 megabit devices, you know, they ran with an 850 LED light emitting dial, right, 850 wavelength. When we bumped up to 100 meg, they actually changed that LED to a 1300 LED. You can see the problem. We have two different light sources. Then when we went to gigabit, because LEDs can't handle uh, gigabit speeds, we had to use VIXELs, what we call vertical cavity surface emitting lasers. So we went back to the 850, but now we have a VIXEL. So between those three network speeds, we have three different light sources. and you know, practicalities, we're not going to make a device that has all three light sources. We're going to theoretically triple the price of that network, so or that port. So what we do is, whatever speed you have on one side with your fiber, speed and fiber type, we need to match that on the other side. So as an example, an SFP on one side that's gigabit multi-mode has to be an SFP gigabit on the other side multi-mode. So a quick uh, heads up, the customer in question, he had this question, he was hooking up 100 meg to gigabit over fiber, and all we did was he changed out his SFP on the one side, pumped them up to gig. Now both sides are running gigabit ethernet, problem solved. So again, the long and the short of it, copper can negotiate speeds, fiber can't. Thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you out on the road at a class. Thank you. We will close this chapter by returning back to fiber optics by showing our new SFP video. Active equipment such as media converters and switches are now commonly equipped to receive small SFPs or small form factor pluggable transceivers. These transceivers simply plug into the unit. It is now the SFP that contains the detector, light source and programmable chip to interface with your network. The SFP flexibility provides the ability to meet your system's changing requirements. All SFPs generally utilize the small LC, MTP, or MPO style fiber optic connectors to serve as the send and receive ports. The basic SFP supports Ethernet speeds of 1 gigabit per second data rates. Single mode or multi mode fiber options are determined by the SFP you select. The SFP Plus is an upgraded SFP enabling up to 10 gigabits per second data rates. Select either single mode or multi mode. And like all SFPs, the SFP Plus is hot swappable or can be plugged or unplugged without powering down. The QSFP or QSFP Plus has the ability to transmit a 10 gigabit signals on a single fiber, but by using four fibers, a total delivery of 40 gigabit transmission rate is achieved. The QSFP uses a MPO or MTP style fiber optic connector mounted on its end, having 12 fiber capability but requiring only eight of these 12 fibers to be utilized. Each send or receive require the four fibers, enabling the 40 gigabits per second data rate. The QSFP28 is designed for 100 gigabit per second data rates. Using the MPO or MTP 12 fiber connector, the four transmit and four receive fibers to the module now have a 26 gigabit per second per fiber, providing four fiber requirement to achieve the 100 gigabit transmission data rate. The AOC cable, or active optical cable that functions as a patch cord contains SFPs that enables 10, 40, and 100 gigabit transmissions. These patch cord style cables are typically short and often used to link switches to a rack or used in high-speed network backbones. AOC style cables production numbers continue to grow. 
All SFPs require programming for successful interfacing to your network. An MSA standard was the objective of Alibaba and Microsoft, plus 22 additional companies, to establish a universal code. The MSA code is the most common programming code presently used. But be aware your network may require one of the following proprietary code of Alcatel, Cisco, Dell, HP, IBM, Intel to name a few. Fiber Instrument Sales is able to program the SFP you require. Also, depend on Fiber Instrument Sales to provide the SFPs or active optical cable you require. Chapter 13 Cleaning Fibers Dirty fiber optics is the number one cause of fiber optic system failure. Availability of the necessary cleaning supplies and forming the habit of properly cleaning each connection point when installing new or reconnecting eliminates this failure cause. This happens to be a John Bruno favorite subject, so we provided him time again to share his thoughts. Immediately, we will follow with a two-minute video on dirty fiber optics. Hello everyone again, John Bruno back at you, Fiber Instrument Sales and FIS University. I want to talk to you about a, uh, a subject that's really near and dear to my heart and something that is really the most important step in fiber optics, hands down, and, and that's cleaning. Uh, we need to be thinking about cleaning our fiber and our connectors and our equipment really all the time. That should be the first and last thought that we have. Uh, Independent surveys show that 85% of all fiber-related issues <clears throat> are related to dirt and contamination. So think about that. We can save 85% of our issues just by being clean. When I do a video uh, on microscopes, you're going to see just exactly what contamination looks like. And contamination, you know, leads to attenuation, which shortens our distances. It, it, it uh, it maximizes optical return loss, so we get a lot of back reflections uh, that can damage our equipment, that can hurt our signal, and again, shorten distances. Dirt can uh, create shatters, chips, and cracks on our connectors. Really not a good thing to have happen. And again, it's the, one of the most basic things and fundamentally the most important thing we can do. Now, there's different ways we can clean. Uh, you know, there's different procedures. There's different pieces of uh, equipment that you can buy. One of the simplest things and really one of our most popular are, are one-click cleaners. This is a, a two and a half millimeter one-click. <clears throat> So that will, uh, that will clean anything with a two and a half mil ferrule, like your STs, SCs, and FCs. Uh, when we look at the LC connector, it has a smaller one and a quarter millimeter ferrule, and it won't clean those. It just is not a very precise fit. So we have a different cleaner for the LC or the one and a quarter mil ferrules. Uh, the one click, uh, if we look at it, if we look at it straight on in the barrel here, uh, there's a cleaning, very small thread cleaning tape here. And inside the unit, you can see the uh, the spool here. That's the spool that's releasing the material. Uh, this can do about 525 clicks before it's used up. We're talking about five or six cents a click. Uh, very affordable, uh, very popular material, uh, our item. <clears throat> Uh, if we need to extend this to go longer reach, we can for panels. Uh, the nice part about this is it does, it spins and cleans at the same time. And uh, literally as its name suggests, one click and we've cleaned the end face. Again, can't be much easier. What I really like about this is we can take the top off uh, and we can clean our female ports. Really, if we think about it, that might even be uh, significantly more important than cleaning the connectors. So if you think about equipment having a connector on the inside and we weren't to clean that and we were to damage those ferrules, uh, very expensive. I know um, doing that to an OTDR can cost about $1,000 to fix. So that five cents a click really isn't that big of a deal. So <clears throat> this is one of the most easiest things you can do. This is a dry clean. I have had a lot of guys actually uh, put a dab of alcohol on the end, clean, so they got the wet clean, clean again, and the dry piece will clean up uh, the wet that was left behind, or any other cleaning solution, doesn't have to be alcohol. Uh, again, when we talk about alcohol, we want to use a 99.9% .9 uh, pure isopropyl when we use it. But again, that's a very effective uh, uh, cleaner. Uh, one of your traditional methods would be to use uh, your uh, your wipes here. 
in, uh, in class, I always ask, what's special about these wipes? And I always hear, well, they're no lint. But if you look very closely uh, under it says fiber optic wipes, it says uh, low lint task wipes meaning there is some lint that can be left behind. Very effective, very most popular wipe that we sell. They aren't lint free. We do have uh, other options. <clears throat> we sell in different configurations. Uh, these are what we call lint free. Uh, non-woven dry wipes or some of the things that you'll hear for these you'll you'll see the, some of these the the low lint ones you know they're a paper material that can tear very easily these are very hard almost a cloth like material uh, this is your no lint wipe uh, more expensive obviously uh, a better clean traditionally we would always see people cleaning and i'm a i'm a big believer in uh, whether you use the the low lint or the no lint uh, is to be aggressive during your clean. So I like to moisten and you can hear that squeak and then we rub our thumb across the tip uh, and that's a very effective cleaning method. I like to actually follow it up with a dry wipe just to clean up the any, any excess uh, alcohol that might have or cleaning material that might have been left behind. Same thing with the non-woven, same process. If we were to follow, you know, the standard as written, the de facto standard, you can see this little QB device here. It's a cleaning cleaning platform. Uh, if we were to follow the letter of the law to, to cleaning, and I, and I don't see this happen often, but uh, as written, technically you're supposed to clean in what we call a star pattern. So <clears throat> we'll take our wipe, put it on a, on a, a uh, a pad that has some uh, give to it so that we can actually do a domed clean uh, and we, we wet this in the center and the star pattern is such you're supposed to spin the fiber in the liquid the connector and then pull away from the liquid in a star pattern. So this is what we call the wet to dry method and really the de facto uh, best possible way to clean. Again, I don't see that a lot uh, in the industry, but uh, as written, that is really the highest standard for cleanliness. But really regardless, you know, before we take a connector out of a pack, you saw me remove uh, the dust cap from this LC, right? This was a manufactured, uh, we manufactured this connection here uh, and it's probably been cleaned 20 times before it ever was to be shipped off. As soon as we put that dust cap on, you know, there's contaminants in a dust cap. Because it's a tight fit, it can cause static and that can actually, the static can attract dust even when we don't touch the dust. So, you know, it, it's really a first and last thought issue. As I mentioned earlier, we constantly have to be cleaning. So even a brand new cable off the spool or out of the bag, really we need to clean. When we plug it in, we need to clean. When we detach it, we need to clean. Before and after, in and out of a microscope, we need to clean. Really, if the question is, should I clean it? The answer is always yes. Remember this, if you have a dirty connector that you didn't know was contaminated and you cleaned it, you did a very good thing. If you had a connector that was clean, you weren't sure and you cleaned it, you did nothing wrong. So there's really, there's really no negative about cleanliness and everything as you can see, falls back to cleanliness. Every technical support call, the first question is if we cleaned everything. And in another video, I will show you what contamination looks like and how easily we can contaminate a connector uh, in a microscope. So thank you for watching this video. And uh, I hope that I I hope that I hear from you and that cleanliness is your number one priority. So thanks again. Dirty fibers are responsible for the most system failures in fiber optic networks. A common bad habit of cleaning a fiber optic connector is a technician swiping the connector across their shirt, or even worse, not cleaning them. Changing these habits for the better, a company needs to implement a proper procedure and require cleaning supplies, which is a minor investment. Here are some of the cleaning supplies that a technician will need. Cleaning kits mounted in a server room or data centers is a common practice and the supplies are right there. Lint-free wipes and isopropyl alcohol are still most commonly used cleaning items. Inexpensive microscope will inspect the condition and cleanliness of an optical connector end face. Dry woven cloth contained in handheld advance holders effectively clean polished ferrule ends. Dust and dirty connector bulkheads are best cleaned with 1.25 and 2.5 mm diameter bulkhead ferrule cleaners. Canned air is often used to clean end ferrule caps before covering the end ferrule. 
Hundreds of cleaning devices are now available. From specialized swabs to camera pass-fail software inspection systems, FIS has the most complete offerings. Proper performance of power meters and light sources, OTDRs and fusion splicers require the same meticulous cleaning attention. Remember, anything brand new out of the package needs to be cleaned. Chapter 14 About the company that provided this free training, Fiber Instrument Sales. The ability to provide its customers the best value, a combination of technical support and vertical integration, has always been our goal. The largest cross-sectional fiber optic inventory at one location provides you quick delivery and is the reason why we receive over 1,500 purchase orders a week. Our reputation has earned us the title Fiber Optic Solutionist. First, let's view our two and a half minute video. Fiber Instruments Sales is a leading manufacturer and distributor of fiber optic products. With administrative, manufacturing, sales, and product warehousing facilities in locations around the United States. Fiber Instrument Sales headquarters and primary manufacturing locations are in Oriskany, New York, approximately 230 miles northwest of New York City. The company's products are used worldwide in telecom, broadband, broadcast, aerospace, transportation, professional sport, and entertainment industries for both commercial and government applications by over 15,000 customers in more than 110 countries. The company's capital investments and reinvestments in state-of-the-art manufacturing equipment, strategic acquisitions, and constant employee development programs have been key to fiber instrument sales growth and success. From FIS's inception in 1985, founder and CEO Frank Giotto has instilled in the company's employees a work ethic committed to unwavering product quality, brand reliability, and leading-edge innovation. It's through Mr. Giotto's leadership that the company's employees and staff have made Fiber Instrument Sales the internationally recognized leader in the fiber optics marketplace. FIS's leadership is recognized not only in the markets in which it participates, but also within the communities hosting its facilities, providing progressive employees and a greater workforce. Over its past 31 years, the company's commitment to employee development has yielded thousands of qualified fiber-related manufacturing experts, tech sector influencers, and also career-building opportunities for youths, seniors, and veterans. Fiber Instrument Sales is also an avid supporter of community scholarships and notable charity initiatives. We invite you to learn more about Fiber Instrument Sales, its role in the marketplace, and possibly its role in your community by contacting us at 1-800-5000-FIS or by emailing us at info at fiberinstrumentsales.com. Fiber Instrument Sales, the Solutionists. In closing out, John Bruno would like to talk once again about his trainings including in person at your location or our online video offerings. After John, a final fun video comparing two splicers starring John and Bob Lakari. Welcome back everyone. Uh, if you've made it to this video in this section, then you've made it through over two hours of our training videos. I hope you enjoyed the journey. I hope you learned something and I hope it can help you. Uh, remember that the F5 Instrument Sales uh, our training and technical services department, all of our technical service that we can provide is free. So if you have questions, please feel free to call us. You can contact me or anyone else in the department. Uh, Bob Lakari, he also uh, is a trainer and he's an OTDR expert, uh, one of the smartest guys that I know in the OTDR business. Uh, but I'm, I thank you for watching the video. I want to talk about the FIS training offerings. Uh, FIS University, we, we established ourselves back in uh, 1996, and we travel all over the country, U.S. and Canada. Uh, we have scheduled trainings that you can see online. Uh, we're usually at three, minimum of three cities a month uh, during the year. During the summer years, the summer months, uh, we are at our Brightside facility. I encourage you to take a look at that uh, online. 
Uh, we teach the same class, but uh, on a resort, an old hotel on Racket Lake in the Adirondacks of New York. And you'll, you'll never take a, a training in a more beautiful place. And the training's excellent too. Uh, all of your meals, your stays are included in the training. Very affordable. Uh, really, I could say there's no other company providing training uh, that does it as affordably as we do. Uh, our goal is to train the people that purchase the stuff from us uh, so they're better and they get more jobs. That's a symbiotic relationship, let's say. Uh, so again, all through the year, we're all over the US and Canada for trainings. Look at that, see if we're close and you can come see us. Uh, some of the new things that we've done, I have a series, uh, an online video course of uh, approximately 20 videos, and I'd say probably more than 15 hours. Uh, you can purchase that series and you get your certificate for completion there. You take a test at the end. That is available to you. As of uh, now, I believe we have over 100 people have attended or watched these videos uh, since we've introduced them. So uh, very successful there. Uh, you're going to see, and I feel free to look at the at our website. Uh, we're doing some online classes. Uh, Frank Giotto, the owner of the company, uh, one day I used the term Johnny's Toolbox. Uh, so for the online training, because I can't be there with you, we set up Johnny's Toolbox, and as part of the price of the class, uh, you get a $275 kit that has your basics, your strippers, your scissors, a microscope, again, that necessity that I talked about in one of the videos, the stethoscope, right, that the doctor needs to have. Uh, when I'll do some online trainings, there are some dates already posted, and we'll be posting more. So I, I really think um, the bottom line is that the training should really pay you back more than whatever you pay for the class itself. And I'm always open for questions, and I like a very interactive class. So I really hope myself or Bob can see you. Uh, in the future at one of our trainings. Uh, I also like to mention the fact that we do do corporate trainings too, so we can come in uh, to, your, to your location and train your staff at your location. What's nice about that is that's customizable. So if there's something that we don't typically cover or that you want more in detailed uh, teaching, uh, we can go into that too. So feel free, call Grace Adele. She's the training coordinator, 315-737-2169. Uh, and she can set you right up. It was a wonderful lady. We have a great group here. So again, thank you for watching all the videos uh, and I appreciate it. And hopefully you'll stay with us and watch more to come. Greetings, FIS fans. This is Bobby LeCurry from FIS University. Just wanted to give you a quick rundown on the brand new 90S Fusion Splicer from Alcara Fujikora. Bobby, 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 stop, stop your videos. Folks, I'm What's sorry. Going on? I just got, came from downstairs and shipping. We have got a crate load of these splicers. Why? And I don't know what it is, Bob. What is this? It's the Fujikora 70S. It's a 70, but I thought we have a 90 now. We do. Well, then why would a customer want to buy this, Bob? What type of features does this how, have? How do we have a whole pail full? Bob, I don't know. Frank Giotto and Kim Teasdale, they've lost their mind, Bob. Oh, my goodness. We got a price these to move, Bob. What type of features does this have? Well, it's got the automated programmable wind protector. Oh, got it's it. got it! 14 second automated tube heater. Got it! Fully ruggedized for shock, dust, and moisture. Got it! The battery can do 200 splices and shrinks per charge. Got it! What about the cleaver? Though? The cleaver. Does this even come with a cleaver? Bob, look I at this workstation. And oh my god, it's got a it's got a cleaver in there. Look at the CT50, Bob. How many cleaves can you do with this? You can do 24,000 cleaves per blade. Is this the one with the automated blade rotation? It sure looks like it. Oh my God. This has to at least go for $20,000, Bob. What type of prices are we talking? We gotta move these. I, they're gonna have to call their FAS representative and negotiate a price. We gotta get these out of here, John. Are we talking about wheeling and dealing, Bob? That's what we're best at. What about your credit, Bob? Good credit, bad credit, not even have any credit? Call us. This is crazy. Frank Giotto is never gonna go. <laughs> Bobby, we got some yes, breaking Jenny. news. We've got Executive Vice President and CFO of Fiber Instrument Sales, Sue Grabinski on the line. Sue, can you hear us? I can hear you. How are you? Sue, I just want you to let you know we're taking all precautions. Bobby, put your hands out. Is that six feet? Hold on. Sue, put your hands out, please. Thank you. Folks, we always got to stay safe in these times. Look, Bob just mentioned, what did you say about credit, Bob? Good credit, bad credit, no credit, we'll take you. And this is what we're going to sue for. She's going to verify that if you've got any type of credit situation, we're going to take you. Sue, what do you think? Well, first of all, the credit application will have to be 
have to be completed and submitted. We'll run the Dun & Bradstreet report, check the credit references. Bobby, I think we're breaking up a little bit here. We're kind of losing the feed, Bobby. Bob, we lost the feed. Folks, I can tell you what she just said. Bob, she was saying credit isn't an issue. We're going to issue it. We're going to sell the units. It's going to be fuse tested. Bob, what type of application can I use this splicer for? Well, you're looking at, you can do distributing fiber repair. Really? You got fiber that breaks, you can fix it. I need you that. You want to use terminations, pigtails, I SOCs. do it all the time. The SOC connector's fantastic, yeah. Bob. If you're fusing glass, this thing's got Oh my God, Bob. I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to take a bath on these things. we are just got to like make a move, Bob. Yeah, th this is going to be one of the biggest promotions we ever had, Johnny. Oh, my God. You know what we're going to do? It's going to be so big, it's going to be... We're going to take this football, Syracuse, first Syracuse player not to drop a ball. <laughs> we're going to take this football, and we're going to pass... Our prices, savings, out of the customer. Bob, what is it? What is it, Bob? It's going it. to be... fuse tastic. That's right, FIS customers. You can get an AFL 70S with most of the same features that you would on an AFL 90S, but for a lower price. FIS has a warehouse full of these fusion splicers and ready for purchase. And remember, good credit, bad credit, or no credit, we'll take you. Call your FIS representative now at 1-800-500-0347. That's 1-800-5000-FIS. Subscribe to our channel for new videos.